Welcome, everyone, as I slowly bring my microphone in front of me to the <laughs> anime. Uh, I don't know. What do you want to call this? The like vivisectus or the uh, the depressing Vivi? The, 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 the mostly the, 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 it's a mashup show because depressed a section. Depressed a section. There you go. <laughs> it's not yeah. good. <laughs> Nah, that's not too bad. It's what we are. We're the, or maybe just the depressed section. There you that's go. who we are. It, it's... We don't have a... You know, we have a problem. Because there is a big fight this week. It's just not an MMA fight. And it's not really a fight that bears breaking down all that much, frankly. I mean, our entire footage of Conor McGregor actually boxing other people is him pretty much losing to uh, that South African dude who released the sparring footage a year ago. And Chris Van Heerden, is he South African? Chris Van Heerden? I think he is. I thought he was Dutch. Well, I mean, you, be, you understand you the context right. of South Africa. It's not the point. Yeah, Chris Van Heerden, the guy who actually did really well against McGregor in sparring, but you wouldn't know it from the footage that was released. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's from South Africa, which, as you say, may also make it also makes him Dutch, but, you know. It's vaguely Dutch. Yeah. Etym make, etymologically, I was on the right track. Yeah, you, you had a point. It just wasn't the right one. Anyway... You know, so we, we know that he sparred with Chris Van Heerden, and Chris Van Heerden really did pretty well against him by all accounts. And then we have uh, like 30 seconds, maybe it's longer than that. I can't remember how much of the footage has actually been released now of him sparring Polly Malignaggi or Malignacci, where he does really quite well. And Malignaggi saying. Malinacci, whatever. I don't give a shit about this. We're going to have boxing fans watching this. I know, but... I don't know where Chris Van Heerden's from. You don't know how to say Polly Malinacci's name. Phil, what's your error for the day? I'm, I'm just going to stay quiet. I'm just going to let you guys <laughs> walk through the rhetorical minefield. I, I know. I, well, anyway, we have a lot to go with on Floyd Mayweather. Even against Southpaws, we've got a lot to go with on Floyd Mayweather. We have... Almost nothing to go on for Conor McGregor to tell us anything about how he does in this fight, other than, and I, I threw this out there the other day, and I, you know, some people, I think the best comp comparison that got brought up was Bob Sapp beating Ernesto Hoost uh, twice, I believe, in kickboxing. But yeah, in terms of profile and storyline, if Conor McGregor won this, and I think this needs to be realized because the odds have gotten stupid, really stupid. And the uh, plot has gotten totally lost on a lot of fans. This would be very likely the largest upset in combat sports history if Conor McGregor won this fight. Yeah, and, and it's one of the few fights where you cannot use betting odds to determine that because the lines have been growing closer and closer as basically like a Bernie Sanders campaign. Conor McGregor has grabbed almost every single money, every single dollar of bets he's taken um, in small, small increments. Whereas like all of these like 30 year old and above people are betting thousands of dollars on Mayweather. You just have tens of thousands of people betting 20, 50, a hundred bucks on McGregor. Uh, I, but I still, I had like, a huge like debate with my uh, with my flatmate who doesn't watch combat, who barely watches combat sports at all, and and I was just explaining how dumb this fight is and how the odds have gotten so stupid and like Conor McGregor is way close to being a favorite than he should be, and at the end she was like, "I'm going to put a bet on Conor McGregor." <laughs> What 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 have I been saying? What have I been saying to you? Uh, I, I think yeah, I'm I, gonna put a bet on Conor McGregor. I I talked to a guy in a bar who you know he even did he, you know he was even like Conor McGregor's not the best MMA fighter that Anderson Silva or Fedor, but Conor McGregor is absolutely gonna blow the doors off Floyd Mayweather, 
and it was all just like he's a, he's a real fighter and these are real fights and Floyd Mayweather is a boxer and he is not prepared to fight a real fight and it's just like they're, but they're boxing yeah i mean i i guess we should say we're going to be watching some other fights later before we get yeah. into our Mayweather McGregor breakdown we, we're, we're going to be doing a, going over some of the history of boxers in MMA because MMA fighters in boxing, hey, you know, we we use Fight Pass, and so we we need stuff that's there aren't any boxing matches on Fight Pass basically at all. There's one Holly Holm fight, I think. What maybe one Holly Holm fight, and uh, boxers getting big or reasonably big MMA fights has a much better easier to access history than MMA fighters getting anything like a reasonable boxing match. Why are we not watching a Holly Holm fight, by the way? Um, <laughs> There's some really bad Holly Holm fights we true, could watch. True. We I mean, could it, be watching a Holly Holm fight. It's true. Yeah, uh, there's always, I mean, we need to, we do need to watch home Kahair at some point, which does, does have a knockout in, but it is also a terrible and underwhelming do, performance. Do you want to do that instead of instead of our second fight, Hunt Nishi, Nishijima? Not really. Okay, all right. We'll, we'll do home Kahea later. It's not one to look forward to watching, that's for sure. We'll get there. I, I actually, but I, I kind of like this lineup because sure. we, we, we went a little twisty with it. We took some some fights that people that wouldn't have expected. We, we didn't choose that many of the big names. Sure. So, so what fights do we have lined up? So what we have lined up, and we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to talk a little more about Mayweather McGregor before we get to them. Our, our first fight up is going to be KJ Noons versus Ryan Couture, the infamously terrible KJ Noons yep. Ryan Couture fight. And, and the only way to find this one on Fight Pass is to actually find the Strike Force event it comes from. So find Strike Force Marquardt versus Safadine. The only way to find that, though, is to yeah. actually go. So go on Fight Pass <laughs> and yeah. search Tark Safadine's name. Because he's had a lot less high-profile stuff than Nate Marquardt. If you search Marquardt's name, you're just going to get a whole shitload of stuff to comb through. But just search Tark Safadine, click on his profile, and scroll down to the videos under his profile, and the Marquardt vs. Safadine event will come up. And then the fight starts at 122.42 left in that, because it counts down backwards which makes it fucking useless, but uh, to timestamp. But it, so if you start play, it'll start counting down. Then you find one twenty two forty two. That's where where uh, KJ Noons versus Ryan Couture starts. And that's our first fight up. After that, we're going to be watching uh, Mark. Is it the Mark Hunt fight? Yeah. After that, we're going to be watching yep. Mark Hunt versus Yosuke Nishijima, pro, former pro boxer Yos, Yosuke Nishijima at Pride 31 Dreamers. And then Rob Broughton versus Butterbean Eric Esch at Cage Rage 19. A Butterbean fight which goes past the first round, so we know we're in for a good time. <laughs> yeah, we're in for a wild ride on that one. Against the guy who I believe gassed really badly in one of his youths. <laughs> I'm, I'm expecting the worst in this fight. I really yeah. am. Butterbean took Larry Holmes to a decision and knocked him <laughs> down. <laughs> the legend. These these are all fighters with legit pro boxing experience. You know, we're, I mean, Nishijima and Butterbean, and then, of course, to finish it all off, the other couture, Randy Couture, in his pay-per-view headlining bout with James Tony at UFC 118 who's easily the best active boxer to ever, to my knowledge, take place in a high-profile MMA fight. Like, James Tony at the time was a little worn down, but he's legitimately an all-time great. Yep. And in his era, he was still doing good things in boxing and continued to do good things after the Couture fight. So that yeah, is... Obviously, there's some, you know, some Mayorgas and Mercers out there who uh, have taken other MMA fights. But... You want to watch uh, Riddick Bowe? Uh, fight Muay Thai because you will be very depressed if you do. <laughs> oh God, no! I I have seen that though. Do you I, watch I would at that point I would rather watch the entirety of uh, 
Oh, damn it. Now I'm starting. I, I just suddenly blanked. Uh... The thought of the thought of Riddick Bow looking like his his legs have aged 50 years more than his upper half. Just I, being I, kicked to pieces by I some no name. I watch the entirety of Mickey Rourke's boxing career. And <laughs> Riddick Bow. Boxing career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even that well, most recent fight, won, that classic. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. recent fight was a real winner. Yeah. Oh. Man. What okay. a buddy shot. So, so, <laughs> so those are our fights. How about Mayweather yeah. McGregor? Um, we I, were... We were talking about it. The, the weird thing about it for, for breaking this fight down is that it, with most things, you are all of your analysis is kind of part of you getting hyped up. You're, you're breaking things down to understand how they might play out. Really, in the fight itself here, the X factor is the only, the X factors are the only interesting pieces. And that's why it's so difficult to analyze because while the fight seems predictable, the X factors, i.e. things you can't predict, are um, are the things that give McGregor a real chance if Mayweather doesn't take him seriously, if Mayweather suddenly looks old, if Conor McGregor is just that confident and doesn't fear Mayweather at all, like even many pro boxers have, like there are opportunities there. But in all likelihood, we're looking at a guy who's never boxed, yep. a good boxer by MMA standards, but a guy who's never boxed taking on um, arguably the best boxer of his generation of the last maybe 10 or 20 years. So yep. somebody who's at least up there. Yeah, it it really is hard. Like it, 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 you can't frame it in any other way and be serious. You can't like any other framing to it is just bullshit. Even like Conor McGregor doing well in sparring against Polly Malinacci, that is like that's legitimately interesting. I mean, that it is, is to an extent. Because, you know, this is a poorly Malinaji who, you know, rolled off the plane out of shape and they immediately, like, apparently just bundled him into a 12-round spa. And he yeah. is clearly very, very tired by yeah. that point. Like, it, he's... Like, fatigue is probably, is probably counting, like, more than anything. That There's a lot to it that is, you know... Th there are a lot of things, like, we didn't, you know we don't have a very good picture of it or the picture we do have like that. So there's a lot of context there. It's how much, how, how much worse is it? If Malinacci is very competitive with McGregor after like apparently not expecting a 12 round sparring session, not knowing what he was there to do, having been past his prime for several years now and never reaching the same heights as Mayweather. Like how, yeah. I, even if we saw Malinacci win six of those 12 rounds, isn't that enough to say that Mayweather wins? Oh, of course, of course. Like it, that, that would be the expectation. Would it be that Malinacci's, you know, just going to at least outwork him generally? Yeah. And so the fact that Conor McGregor did even like pretty well, may have done very well. Who knows? But by all accounts, at least got under Malinacci's skin with the whole thing. Yeah. Well, that's the the thing I want to I, I think we should really focus on is is this is countering and then reassessing this this common uh, this common idea that McGregor is a terrible boxer. Because yeah. that's that's the idea from the boxing community. McGregor can't box. He's a bum. I have absolute confidence that if Conor McGregor went back a few years and dedicated himself to a boxing career, he could probably do pretty well. He's a phenomenal fighter, and, and that much is clear. And it is his stand-up that stands out. But the, the whole thing is that people are talking about this, like you said, Zane. Oh, he's, it's a real fight. He's a real fighter. He's going to use crazy angles and weird things. Jack Slack posted uh, one of my favorite tweets in the lead-up to this fight on Twitter yesterday when he said that the, reason, the, the way that people say angles, use the word angles without any further explanation of what that means – is the reason I got into fight analysis. And yeah, that's kind of it. Like, okay, yeah. he's going to use angles. What angle? What angle? <laughs> he's going to throw punches from further away. He's going to throw looping punches. He's going to, like, he might have some tricks of timing, but so do all the boxers that boxers face. Pe the thing is, is that Conor McGregor does well in MMA because he's a better boxer than most of his opponents. And he has some somewhat un unorthodox boxing game. But a lot of that is just like 
cool looks he uses to psych you out while he's boxing you up. The karate stance, the spinning kicks, these things aren't usually 10% as effective as he is with his hands. They set up the hands. And without those things, he's just a pretty good boxer against the best boxer of his era. So, yeah, so, so this is one of the this is one of the things, and this is why I feel like the issue is like you know I feel like we've we've seen so we've got the idea that we don't really know what Connor can do in boxing, but we know what Mayweather can do. I don't really feel like we know. I don't really feel like we know either side of the equation for the simple fact that we've, like, bluntly, we've never seen Mayweather box anyone as bad as McGregor. Like, <laughs> at least not in, not in recent memory. And it is just a, it is just a different game. Yeah, I, I, I don't even know too. what I'm going to... I don't even really know what I'm going to see from Mayweather because someone much worse than him would... Because Mayweather, Mayweather's game is is built to extract all the possibility of winning from extraordinarily elite fighters. Like he is an anti-boxer boxer, and like, and we can and we can watch him do that. And I don't really feel like. We we've ever really like we're just gonna see him. How much? How, what percentage of Mayweather is necessary to win this fight? Right. Like, how deep does he need to go? Because I'm gonna guess like not very deep. I guess he he's gonna have to like we've he's gonna be using counters and defensive techniques that he just wouldn't even bother trying in other fights. We just, we've literally never seen him against someone who's going to likely, I mean, this is no, again, no disrespect to Connor. He's, he's just never, he's just never boxed professionally before. Yeah. But we, he's just going to, we, we just, we just never seen Mayweather box someone that bad. Yeah. yeah it, w- it would not be a shock to me at all. If Mayweather casually won 12 rounds with his jab alone, that would not shock me. Um, because I think the thing, the, the real things here, like the difference between what McGregor brings to the cage and what Mayweather brings to the ring. And again, we are assuming that Mayweather looks something like his old self, that he's 70% the man he was at least. You're telling me that all of his talk about how old he is and how feeble and how much he's partying. And- yeah, he's laying out on a little thick, isn't he? <laughs> the guy's expecting him to like... <laughs> Seriously, guys, I promise I'm not taking him seriously. I'm definitely yeah. underestimating him. I, uh, I, I seriously half expected him to like show up with a video of him with like a big wood block and a sledgehammer and like putting his ankle on it and being like, <laughs> man, I'd hate to have to do this, but I just had to a week out from the fight. I guess I'm just going to have to fight with this bum ankle now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's he, May- Mayweather, by the way, who I've heard doesn't even drink is like hanging out at his club all day. Like he's getting wasted. He's not, he's just there being a boring person. Like just like smiling at patrons and like pretending to be interested in the women who look like every other woman he's ever spent every day of his life with. Like he's just bored. Non-training downtime there. Yeah. He's just resting at his club. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) Maybe drinking like a soda with lime. Uh, The thing is, is the two things that, that stand out between these two, a, I want to talk about defense. Obviously that's Mayweather's thing. McGregor is not a bad defensive fighter. Um, he's developed some really nice head movement. But McGregor is like uh, Tyson-esque in everything he does. Everything is really explosive, and that includes his defense. Uh, when you make McGregor slip a punch or when he tries his pool counter, a move which looks really impressive, but let's not forget, he basically cribbed it from Floyd Mayweather. Uh, everything is very intense um nate diaz exhausted connor not just because he got tired of beating nate up but because he everything he reacted to was such a big reaction and i think it's really going to stand out here when we see that mcgregor tries his first jab of the fight and mayweather just boop, just catches it in his glove or he tries a second jab after and it's pull it's slip everything is small it's six inch movements that come from the hips everything's easy mayweather can do these things for 50 rounds because they take no energy and they're perfectly ingrained. So he doesn't even have to think about them. Uh, that's a big thing. So McGregor's gas tank is going to be a question here. Because even if he does pretty well technically, technique for technique early, 
he's going to be using more energy both in throwing his punches and in defending Mayweather's. Well, and, and also, I, I want to bring this up because it's something I've been thinking about a lot with this. Um, especially cardio mm. does not translate with athleticism from sport to sport. And I, a lot of that, I think, honestly, and this is just a pet theory, so you have to take it with massive grains of salt, is that your body because you're not used to doing whatever new exercise you're doing and a pro boxing bout in front of a huge audience is going to be brand new, whatever, you know, even if McGregor has fought sparred rounds in the gym, even though he has fought on pay-per-view in front of massive audiences in MMA, it is still going to be a new experience. Yeah. Um, your body, you don't know, you don't, you no longer have, a uh, sense memory and expectation of what comes next, of what is happening in front of you. Yeah. You have to do everything off Too much reaction. In, and improvisation. Learn. Yeah. Yeah. And your body, when you do that, you tend to have these little panic adrenaline dumps. You know, yeah. it's like if you go from going and like running on an aerobic machine and you get really good cardio and you're like, Oh man, I'm like in so such good shape on this treadmill and that's all you do. And then you go outside and you go for a run, even that you aren't going to run as far or as well yeah. because you're no longer, your body is having to adjust constantly to this new exercise you're doing and you get these little dumps of adrenaline and they just exhaust you. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's and a feedback mechanism. It's a feedback mechanism yeah. as well because you're going to be going, you're going to be getting these little dumps of adrenaline, and then you're going to be like, "Why am I so much tired? Why am Why am I more tired than I normally am?" And then you'll get like a little, you'll get a little dump of adrenaline when you suddenly yeah. realize that. And you know, it's so it, it becomes this self reinforcing loop where you know it's the classic. Is yeah, I totally agree with this. It. It's the you know the octagon jitters thing, the MMA yeah. debut thing, the it's, you know people. Just, it's almost impossible to be to be ready for it's it. It's one of the reasons that experience means anything in like a sport where doing something right. in the repetition and getting out there and have, because, being comfortable with it matters at all is because you have to learn, your body has to learn to be comfortable with all of these things you're doing yeah. so that it doesn't exhaust you and panic and that's, make mistakes. People are like, oh, he's a real fighter. He's going to do fighting things. Well, that's the point. It's not a fight. Yeah. It's a boxing match. And if you treat it like a fight, if you treat it like you are in a fight and you are in danger and you have to put this guy away or he's going to put you away, you're going to freak out and you're going to get tired. Boxing and martial arts in general, like it's it, the whole thing is just the practice of overcoming your instincts so that you can be more effective in combat. It's not about being a fighter and using crazy things the other person doesn't see. It's about knowing how to manage yourself. And that that's the other big difference here is that in, in addition to the how taxing everything McGregor does is compared to how taxing everything Mayweather does is that Mayweather has a very keen sense of that kind of thing. Uh -huh. Mayweather knows how much something is going to tax him, how much it's going to tax his opponent. I can't imagine for the life of me a sequence in this fight in which Conor McGregor gets backed into the ropes and lets Floyd Mayweather throw punches at him. Lets him throw so he can miss and exhaust himself or so he can feel how good McGregor's defense is or so he can get a minute of rest himself. Uh, obviously, fighting in the cage is very different. The fence is a different sort of obstacle than the ropes. But when McGregor got backed up into the fence in that rematch with Nate Diaz, he wasn't comfortably making Nate miss. Uh, his goal is to avoid the fence at all costs because he's in trouble if he gets there. Whereas yeah. Floyd Mayweather will let you corner him, not just against the ropes. He'll let you put him in the corner if it means giving him a chance to see what you're offering to like it's almost like he's like here please show me all of your 10 best punches right now and then most fighters who don't have boxing experience i.e mcgregor will do it they'll show mayweather everything they have in those first few rounds and after that's done mayweather has done basically nothing to lower his energy stores he has collected all the data he needs to start building the fight he wants and mcgregor is already getting tired he's having to improvise and react on the fly to everything in front of him it's just a matter of like subtlety and bout control i guess you could say that mayweather is a phenomenal strategist and it is a unique kind of strategy you need to have in your head for the specific thing that is a 12 round boxing bout and uh, mcgregor's never been a great strategist even in mma he's a phenomenal tactician but 
the, he can lose sight of the fight as a whole when he's in the midst of the exchanges. And that absolutely never happens to Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. I mean, I, it's like that um, Andre Berto uh, video where he says what, you know, what it was like to fight Floyd. And it's exactly that, that kind of idea that he is constantly hyper aware of everything yeah. that's going on. And you don't feel like anything is happening. You just feel like you are fighting a void. And, yes. And looking there, looking over here, and looking up at the clock, and looking back, and like staring at him between his rounds. And he's like, he's just, he's just real observant. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's just he's... constantly aware of, of like the flow of the fight and where it's Mayweather going. Mayweather is and... the, he's the calmest paranoid who has ever lived. <laughs> yeah. He is like in the ring. He's like, everything is like eyes open, looking at everything, seeing everything, but he's never freaking out because everything's trained in all the reactions. Like if he sees it, he know he doesn't even have to think about how to stop that jab or how to duck under that right hand. Yeah. Everything I was say, flow chart. That, that was the thing I, you know, I did a, a bunch of editing for a, uh, one of our other analysts at Bloody Elbow, uh, Kostas, um, he's Greek and I'm not going to try to butcher his last name. F- Fanto Sekis, I think? Yeah. Uh, he, he always goes, just goes by Kostas Font on Twitter. So there we go. Legit. There we go. Make it easy on us. Um, but he, he's been doing these big, big breakdowns of how Mayweather boxes Southpaws. And, so, you know, I had, to, I went, had to go through, read it all, learn it all, edit it all watch it all and the thing that you get from it is just like every single part of his game for fighting even left-handed fighters is just it's all so so set like he knows these are the different strikes that can come at me in any one area and i have a set way to shut every one of them down every time without worrying about it You know, it's always when I back up this way and throw this punch, I slip out this direction in a way that there's no, there's nothing to hit me. There's nothing that can hit me there. I slip, I pull back this far and then I throw this punch and then I slip in this direction and there's nothing to hit me there. Or, you know, if there is something that should, that could have hit me, clinch, clinch, pull, redirect. Or I have another move after that. Like everything fits together any move that mayweather does it transfers weight from one foot to the other it turns the shoulders from one side to the other it moves the head up and down or side to side there's always another direction to go archie archie moore called uh that escapology Uh, he said that when he was fighting he was always building bridges he was always giving himself a bridge to cross if one punch didn't work out or if one defensive uh, reaction was wrong there was always another one already laid out sometimes two or three bridges from any new position so that you're never stuck you are never yeah. lost for ideas and you never have to guess and you see yeah. floyd too when he fight like he'll throw a punch or he'll throw like two or three punches and he'll be slipping even if his opponent is doing nothing he's yeah. slipping out of the way he's pulling back he's ducking out of the way and moving out in a way that's just even if you had thrown something i wouldn't be there to be hit they they yeah. are they're different sports. That's the the big thing to, rem- to remember throughout all of this. McGregor does not represent MMA in this boxing match, just as uh, as we'll see in a bit. James Tony didn't represent boxing when he had an absolute shit show against Randy Couture. Um, the the point is is that Mayweather is systematic in the way that great old school fighters are. That everything he does is about neutralize, take away, and punish, and it's always in that order. He's going to take away your, he's going to learn how to stop your weapons from hurting him. He's going to punish you for throwing them. And then when you've lost faith in them, he's going to beat you up a little bit and then coast to victory. And not only have I never seen Conor McGregor in an MMA fight or a boxing match for that matter, neutralize, take away, and then punish his opponents. I have, I rarely even see MMA fighters do that. It's a whole nother game. Even in five-round fights, rare is the MMA fighter who comes out and throws away a round because he wants to see what his opponent has to offer. It's just a different game. One of the rare fighters, a a rare recent example we have of that, and it it is weird to see it because you really never do, is Robbie Lawler against Donald Cerrone. Yeah. Like, that is one of the very rare times you can think of where Lawler threw, like, he landed, like, three punches in a whole round and it was for no other reason than just to 
recover and get a bead on all of Donald Cerrone's offense and then come back in the next round and tee off on it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so, like, I mean, I think that's, like, the the idea of, like, the systematic defense is, like, it speaks to a really important thing about Mayweather in that I think people tend to think that he's people tend to think that what he's doing is computing lots of different things which are going on. And I don't really think that's what he's doing, or at least not, uh, you know, that's why he's so adaptive. He just learns everything that the guys are doing. He's not learning everything that people are doing. He's ignoring the vast majority of what they do. That's mm. why he's able to uh, adapt is because he has systematic options that make yeah. mean that he can just say, I don't care about this. I don't, he, he just dumps everything into a kind of minimum. Like the, the hardest thing about fighting is, to me, well, from the outside, is that it, it is, well, one of the, one of the, like, the mentally challenging things is that it, there is simply a limit to how much people can process. And what, what Mayweather is doing is he, he is simply dumping tons of stuff into a, I can dip into this bucket if I want it, like, to find structures, like, but other than that, I don't care. He's just ignoring it. It's all systematic. And this is also, incidentally, like, and this sort of links back to Zane's earlier point, why I think Mayweather would be a terrible MMA fighter. <laughs> if, if you put him, and I mean like not as in if he started MMA when he was young. I mean, if you put, you know, modern, some kind of iteration of modern Floyd Mayweather into MMA, he would be, he would be awful because he is built to do that. He is built to, he has been built like, so this idea of like building the structured processes, it's kind of like he's been mapping out pathways in sort of probability space, a bit like, you know, Greg Jackson's nodal, you know, nodes in fights, you know, you go here and then you can do this and so on. And that's sort of what people do in these, in these spaces. But the thing is that that's something that disintegrates very quickly when you throw like alien things into the mix. It's like the, you know, like, like Connor's often, as in you, Connor, not not uh, <laughs> McGregor. Like often said that like it's not stance is stance isn't really the you know the big difference between MMA and uh, and boxing. And I think and I agree with that because I think it is literally that you can learn like Mayweather has these immensely complicated systemic trees of where everything goes. But if you changed things it would be like throwing vast, ugly wedges right into the, right into the core of, of that tree, and it would just disintegrate. He would quickly go into that kind of space that, that Zane was talking about earlier, where, you know, he'd start to get the adrenaline dumps. Things would start to dramatically, like his, his ability to perceive space would immediately be, almost immediately be destroyed. Yeah. Like, Marcos Maidana would be a far better MMA fighter than Floyd Mayweather would. He he went for a nice clinch knee in his rematch with Mayweather, so you're probably I think he had a nice single leg in one of those fights too. So yeah, you're definitely onto something. I, I think that's a great that's a great point. Like the, my idea is that the the system takes care of it, all the tactical mm -hmm. shit. The system takes care of it. So I think that really frees somebody like Mayweather up to be strategic, to think about the fight in the big picture, to think about every exchange in the context of the fight as a whole. Uh, yeah, but I you're think right. That's like part of why he's hyper observant like people talk you talk about yeah. somebody being hyper observant and why they can do that and how it's amazing and it's because he's not concerned about all the other shit yeah he already has the reactions for them like he's observant because he's not worried about what the next punch is going to be he knows he can take care of it yeah. uh, and if it catches him he knows he can adjust and take care of it the next time around and so on and so forth the, the idea is i think that a good system trained into a great fighter um ensures that the fighter always has some kind of initiative that they are never having to uh, guess or react on the fly, that they are always, in some sense, controlling the fight. Uh, and when you introduce so many more options, it's impossible, I think, to have a system that covers. It may, in fact, be impossible to have an MMA system that covers MMA techniques as thoroughly as some of the best boxing systems do. You'll probably yeah. never have a George Benton of MMA uh, because like there's all th th there's always going to be something else that they haven't accounted for in the flow chart. Well, it, it, it's, it's the idea of why specialists will always have a very real right. elite place in MMA is because right. 
you can only get so good at jujitsu like, doing just MMA. McGregor's going to lose to Mayweather because Mayweather wouldn't be a good MMA fighter. Like that's the point. Yeah, he's, that, he's just the, a good. He's just a good boxer. Like he's the, he's he's developed. I mean, you know, he's everything he's done is to be a, and you know, I mean, I suspect I don't know what we're gonna see, but as I would suspect there are much worse boxers, there are much worse boxers than than Mayweather that would destroy McGregor much more convincingly. Mm-hmm. But that's yeah. not what his style's meant to do. It's not meant to destroy people convincingly. It's meant to yeah. completely extract all risk from the process. It means, I mean, and there's no, you know, even you know, Mayweather's style isn't obviously perfect, but but it's the idea that that you have to if you want to if you want to find the ways of getting past it you want to you know bang body shots past his elbows you want to reach in to you need to reach in super far to throw like to throw a shot and to catch him all the way leaning back you know these are low percent these are low percentage and you need to be able to build structures around them to get to those places yeah, right. so that he can know when those things are coming and the way to do that is to like the crazy thing is everyone always has always been saying oh you beat mayweather by brawling with him which is the stupidest idea in the, in the world because you are basically going in there and saying i'm going to fight thoughtlessly uh against somebody who is one of the best thinkers in the world of sports uh, because I'm hoping he, that maybe I'll catch him before he has time to realize what's going on. Like that's the way to beat Mayweather. And this is why it's so difficult is to have a system as complete as Mayweather's is to understand how to neutralize what he does to make him fight a different fight than one he wants to fight. And like not even Manny Pacquiao could manage that uh, yeah. an older Manny Pacquiao for sure. But like even Manny Pacquiao couldn't think as well as Floyd Mayweather could in the ring. I mean, and it, I think all of that really comes down to having a perfectly reliable, well-rounded, um, almost omnipotent, systematic approach to fist fighting. All right. Mm-hmm. Should we move on from that point? Because I think well, that, that so, uh, well, so what are our what are our picks? <laughs> well, <laughs> you got to go for method, right? You have to go for method and round. Yeah. 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 I am going to pick. Floyd Mayweather by seventh round TKO exhaustion. I think that it's going to be just a the 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 ref or the corner has to stop it because Conor McGregor is too tired to go. Keep going. I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick unanimous decision. I think that, like, I think Conor McGregor's weird. I think McGregor's weirdness isn't going to. Like it's not going to be able to get him the win like people think it is, but it's going to make Mayweather just a little bit more like I'm. I'm not even going to try and risk this. I'd look, you know, he's such a he's so risk averse, and he it's just going to make him just that little bit more. So he's just going to be happy to ride out a sparring a sparring match. He's yeah. Mayweather is maybe too much of a narcissist to <laughs> confront McGregor. Um, come to the conclusion that he actually is dangerous and he could surprise him. And then, like, just continue to fight him on even terms. <laughs> like, I that that is a possibility. I think, though, that um, like um, McGregor will probably buy himself a few rounds in which Mayweather is maybe he feels he's doing well, but Mayweather's probably just kind of calculating and getting a look at him. I think once the exchanges begin, there won't be enough of them to tire McGregor out really quickly. But I think each exchange is going to take its toll on him a lot more than it does on Floyd, especially if Floyd is working the body which he does mm-hmm. really, really well. Um, so I'm thinking Mayweather by like a ninth or 10th round TKO. I think McGregor's going to get tired. I think it's going to get to the point where like he goes down on a jab or something. It's just uh, hard to watch like, you know, McGregor getting exhausted in two five round fights where he just yeah. hit the point. I mean, the fact that he came back in the second Nate Diaz fight is still amazing considering and- how how exhausted he looks in that fight and it's two straight fights where he's gotten himself tired to the point that he looks like he can't go on anymore and that's in fights that he's comfortable that's in fights that he has all of the tools he needs around him to win so in in a boxing match in his first pro boxing match i just can't see him making it 12 rounds 
if Nate hadn't gassed yeah, himself the second time around, he probably would have won. <laughs> like yeah. the momentum was shifting really dramatically against McGregor, and he really did kind of need Nate to slow down for him so he could get himself back into it. He got himself into it. He's tough. Yeah. He can fight. We know that. But yep, I have to say that the Diaz the Diaz cardio is in the modern game a little bit of a myth nowadays. Like it's yeah. it's not yeah. good. It's not what what it was, and it's not what it is certainly not what it is compared to like other people in the sport nowadays. Not like, compared to your to your average boxer in a stand up fight. Yeah, you think like even yep. like the the thirtieth ranked welterweight in the world is gonna struggle to go twelve rounds with Conor McGregor uh, because of conditioning? No. Absolutely not. No way. All right. Well, on that note, let's get into these fights because we got obviously plenty more to do here, and. Yep. Uh, Get into first of all KJ Noons versus Ryan Couture from Strike Force Marquardt versus Safadine at 122 minutes and 42 seconds left in the broadcast. So the moment you start it, it goes to a countdown clock. 122.42 is where we are starting. Everybody ready? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Three, two, one, go. We're getting Ryan Couture looking reasonably wide startled. eyed as always. <laughs> looking reasonably startled. Yeah. Ryan Couture looking like he stepped through whatever, like he just walked through a door and expected to wind up in a bed, bath, and beyond. <laughs> and this is the scene that's confronting yeah. him. He's like, what the fuck? Where am I? So, somebody just like, he stepped through a door and somebody just handed him the shirt and the gloves. And we're like, <laughs> He was wearing like a short dress shirt with a tie, and it was like, "Here's a tap out shirt. Go fight." <laughs> did you guys ever see? Did you guys ever see like Quantum Leap, like the the t- the TV series where the dude would like teleport mm-hmm. through time and end up in like different people's bodies? <laughs> like, maybe he just like that's the beginning of this episode. <laughs> he just combines himself walking through the walking through the the uh, the entrance for. Strike but, but force, the, Mark Quart versus Safadine. Ryan Couture it would actually be a very good, well trained, well conditioned, actually quite competent fighter. Except <laughs> yeah. at the moment he's about to fight every fight, somebody quantum leaps into his body, and they're just like. <laughs> and they, they're always, they're always slight. Like you can see, there's a look of calm on Ryan Couture's face. They're always slightly relieved when, like, through very helpful exposition, one of their cornermen says. As you know, you are the son of Randy Couture, one of the best MMA fighters ever. And they think, all right, okay, <laughs> okay. I'm pretty good yeah. at this. I've got, I've got a shot. The fight is always a disappointment after that point. Yeah, is that is there, uh, there's a reason why he always seems to be muttering to some invisible guy like whilst <laughs> in the middle of the fight? Oh, oh. Well, good note to start this one off on. Sam, I think that's says you be- have only a 4% chance of winning this bout. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing about Ryan Couture is it always kind of makes me uh, it always kind of makes me wonder like there's like you, you remember that that Schwarzenegger DeVito film Twins where like there's the improbable thing of like the dude who who got all the yeah. uh, like yeah where Arnie gets all the good genes and, and, and the Ryan other one Couture Danny gets, DeVito uh, right, Danny DeVito gets all the shitty ones and like, I like to imagine that there's like, there's some like, amazing, like, illegitimate son of Randy Couture out there somewhere, just, just like this, working the field somewhere. <laughs> he like, gets into like a bar and fight and just instantly just key locks the other guy or something some without like, ever training. Hulking man, God, who's just like. This amazing natural fighter who, yeah, never never picked it up. And then there's Ryan Couture out on the other side. It's just... Oh. Poor guy. guy. He's, he, he has such a, like, really solid oh, grasp on who he we, is. We, we, oh, we should... Yeah, Connor's fucking disappeared somewhere. Okay. Uh, starting now. Now. All right. He has a really solid grasp on who he is as a fighter and how he should fight and like and what his career is like and what his expectations are. There's no delusion there. But Yeah. I mean, he's yeah, he's one of the good like benchmark guys who's like you, you can look at him and just think he's about as good as he's ever gonna be. 
Uh-huh. And that's not very good. Physicality is a really, really hard barrier. It really is. On the other hand, you get KJ Noons, and, you know, okay, I get that. I like KJ Noons. I like watching him fight in his glory days. He's a very fun fighter at his height. Um, I get that, you know, there's that he probably should have won this fight, technically. But there's just something about KJ Noons, the fighter, that it makes so much sense that he lost a fight like this. Yeah. Like, I mean, he's, yeah, he, he's like the, he's the low power, like, I mean, he's, a, he's a lesser power version of, of like, Paul, he's one of those guys who just never learned to stop being terrified of grappling in any <laughs> way, shape, or form. Like, that he's, yeah. he's just never not horrified by the concept of going to the ground. You can see and, the way he punches there. He's hit just... with a hard knee in that exchange yeah. just because he's panicking so much about Ryan Couture having hold right. of him. The moment Ryan Couture puts palms on his shoulders, he ducks his head, looks away from his opponent, closes his eyes, and takes a knee. I mean, yeah. as such, KJ Noons is the is the great example of the MMA contextual action fighter, mm-hmm. the guy who will be in good fights. It will be people will be like, "Oh, this guy's such a great," you know, "this guy's a, always good for the good, good for action." And he is if you put him in one specific kind of fight, and otherwise he's going to be pretty awful. You put him in with a Diaz brother, and those fights are going to be fun all the time because they just want to stand and trade with him, and it'll be super fun to watch. You put him in just about any other kind of fight, and man, the the returns diminish quickly. It does. It does baffle the mind that, like, look at the way KJ is fighting this fight. He's uh, the first round started, by the way, several minutes ago. We we, we did your job yeah. for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. He uh, like KJ will do these moves, like he's he'll back up, pull his head back as if he's expecting a punch. Ryan Couture, I don't think, has thrown a punch yet. <laughs> like he's fighting as as if by waiting for him to start boxing, he will then be able to outbox him. Yeah, but. Like, just go after him, throw punches at him. Like, th- do this. That'll work. Just throw jabs and right hands. But he just, he never does it. Like, unless you bring a boxing fight to KJ Noons, he's at a loss. I mean, you get the Josh Berkman fight where they just right. looked at each other for yeah, three it, rounds. It's like, just take three steps forward and throw some, not to be the douche, the drunk douche in the crowd, but fucking hit him already. <laughs> like, you're a boxer, man. Just hit him. He's basically yeah. decided he's going to throw, he wants to throw an uppercut on a level change. He, yes. he wants to throw an uppercut on a level change, and God damn it, he's going to wait until that level change comes if it <laughs> takes him 15 minutes. 15 minutes and 30 absorbed leg kicks, he's going to do it by God. Yeah, it's because it too, like almost all of his boxing is as a reaction to Couture reaching in on him, not even like throwing right. punches, but it's like he had Couture has to initiate a grapple exchange even. For him to box yeah he's landed some nice counters here he's yeah. actually getting into a bit of a rhythm now couture is not setting up his strikes because he's not really sure how yeah couture is just flicking out the long he, he couture ha, has learned at some point very very firmly that all your punches should be straight and yeah. that's it and you should throw a lot of low kicks yep. that's the jab of mma zane is the low kick <laughs> It's just as quick. It's just as versatile. <laughs> the it's, jab. it's the jab. Yeah, it's the jab of MMA. Oh, God. What a special sport. Ooh. Nice shot I mean, there from Couture. Yeah. yeah. Noons landing pretty- a couple hard shots as well. Noons gets boxing range, decides he should throw a front kick that misses. <laughs> Good move. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just always frustrated by Nunes is like unless he's fighting Nick Diaz because yeah. the moment you yeah. brought the moment you brought this fight up, I was like, "Ooh, we could watch Nunes Diaz." Ooh, he okay, so cra- okay. KJ Nunes actually does know how to grapple. He just doesn't realize it most of the time. He got hit by a, a, yeah. a nice wheel kick there, though, right in the throat. yeah. <laughs> yeah, he got Look at his face. hit by a wheel kick, then a then a straight left hand follow up, like. Which is, you know, very, very Conor McGregor, I think, of of, of Ryan. Of Ryan uh, also, it should be noted that you know. Noon. I, I don't even know if ever more than this fight, he's really got the Charlie Brenneman thing going on. 
Yeah. <laughs> but, like every punch looks like it hurts him a little harder because his whole hair just shakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 did he even hit Couture or did he just fall because he lunged in too hard? I don't know. It's hard to see if Noon's actually landed a punch that sat Couture down. <sighs> oh, KJ. KJ to me always looks, um, let's see, we'll see if he landed a punch after this beautifully, perfectly executed oh, spinning kick to the shoulder. The chest. I thought it hit the throat, but it was to the chest. He didn't, nope, he didn't he even hit him. Forearm. No, he, he just fell over. The forehead with a forearm. Oh my God. Yeah. Noons to me always looks, especially like after a round, he always looks like a chastised little kid, like a sort of like a, a very rebellious, like angsty. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it always looks like he's just been scolded. He's just been like, sent to his room instead of the corner. <laughs> but he's not he's not cowed. He's really sullen and resentful about it. Like he's <laughs> never he's never happy with how the fight's going. <laughs> it's a little surprising he doesn't just actually face the fence every time, like <laughs> His coach makes him stand in the corner facing the post. That's right. <laughs> Think about what you just did and then do it better next round. <laughs> I would love if corner time was timeout for KJ Noons. I guess that attempted that uppercut. The, uppercut, the, the yeah. lunging, dipping uppercut. How about a straight right? Hook. How about a straight mm. right? Wouldn't that be nice? How about like a straight punch? <laughs> <laughs> Of any kind. From- <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> like, this is why so many MMA fans have no fucking idea what they're talking about when they're they're talking about McGregor, Mayweather, and, and boxers in general, because this is what we've been told as MMA fans is what a boxer looks like. Yeah. KJ Noons is the boxer of MMA. He threw yeah. a straight punch to the body. He, he's got all he's also got some of that Fabio Maldonado thing in him where he like he <laughs> makes the defensive moves without actually ever defending punches yeah. when they come after him. Because, yeah, because nobody wants to punch with him. So, yeah. like, it's hardly ever even useful. He's just, he's just like, touching his chin. And then, you know, he might get hit with a random wheel kick at some point. But <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, so, like, who are our guys where they'd, they'd constantly bleat on about their pro boxing experience? It would be it was KJ Noons, Maldonado, and also Chris Lytle. Marcus mm. Davis Ooh. and Little Nog. Yeah, yeah. Little oh, Nog, yeah. For sure. Although not pro experience, but he did train with the Cuban, the Cuban yeah. amateur team. So that is actually legit too. Headbutt in there. Ryan Couture yep. really following the rules too of. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> man. Yeah. Did Ryan, Ryan Couture just knocked him down with like a right hook? Right. No, I think he uh, did, yeah. The kick and, is the fucking jab of MMA. He set up that punch yeah. with a kick, and it worked. Because. Because Noons is leaned so far weirdly over trying to hit that lunge uppercut that the hook just, like, totally caught him off guard. What, what got just happened by, there? Yeah, what, he got hurt by nothing? Yeah, it looked like he got... It, was, it looked like an eye poke more than, like... It looked like he reacted to an eye yeah, poke rather than... Yeah, he really strong, shelled up and he's wobbly. He's yeah. very wobbly in that. He got hurt somehow in there. An upper, Maybe an uppercut, finally. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wait, Ryan Couture wins this fight? Yeah, Ryan Couture wins. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> He's already lost two rounds. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether he lost. Did he lose the first round? I mean, Noons didn't do anything, and he didn't actually lot. land. A, yeah, yeah I guess maybe. KJ Noons did, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, KJ also looks like shit. Like his face is covered in blood. He's exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I love the kind of desultory kick as he just stumbles yeah. away. Oh, man, this is such a weird fight. I forgot how weird this fight is. Throw a jab, KJ. <laughs> throw two in a row, maybe. Just only throw jabs, even. Just only throw jabs. You would be shocked at how well it'll work. No. Uh, Body KJ jab. Is, is one of those guys like, just like... Um, <laughs> What's his face? Who are we looking at? Uh, Weidman's id last time. Oh, John Vellante. Oh, John Vellante. He just doesn't have. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> Ooh, lovely counter there. Yeah. Couture, Couture gets hit almost as hilariously as Jake Shields gets hit. He does. He yeah. really. Lo- he looks like he's wearing heelys the moment you touch him yep. with a punch. He, he has the one foot in the roller skate striking style. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one leg spinning off in a random direction. Yeah. And he never knows which foot it's going to be. At any moment, that roller skate could appear. 
Oh, man. What a fight. What a great fight so far. Boy. The- I mean, this <laughs> is KJ clean. KJ, like, gets <laughs> hands up after nothing. It just gets <laughs> clocked with a straight left for no good reason. <laughs> KJ pretends he uses his hands for defense where they're like constantly hanging at his belly button and they fly away from his face whenever a punch actually <laughs> approaches him. If Couture would just stand and throw three punches in a row, I bet you KJ Nunes could knock him out. Like, and that's the thing. I can you can start to see why Couture won this fight because you have to yeah. admit, you've forgotten at this point that Couture was almost out on his feet earlier this round. Yeah. Yeah. He's just got like he just he just reuses every piece of momentum from every strike he uses because he doesn't want to waste it. He's just like ah, better try and throw, better try and stumble into something else. Here just we go. Like, Some highlights. Stop. Oh, headbutt! The headbutt. Nice head clash. Yeah, that yeah, opened the cut. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> A devastating left hand. Oh, <laughs> I, mean, I think yeah, I think he he was probably hurt by that for quite a while. Yeah, yeah, I think you might be right. Like <laughs> he spent he spent the next minute and a half sta- staggering from that punch. <laughs> he just fights like 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 that quop game. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> each limb just is controlled like, by a like, different key. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like ragdoll physics. Like everything keeps moving after you press the button. Like try oh, and convert man. it into a spinning back fist, then into a knee, then into a front kick, and then somehow stagger back out of range before you die. <laughs> it is still like you can't really give that round to Couture after getting hurt that badly, despite the fact that he made a mess of it in the oh, second yeah. half. It's very definitely yeah. KJ's round. I, th- I think Phil was right. I think Couture spent about a minute and a half of that round pretty wobbly on his legs. And it, I mean, the value here, what you're really seeing in Ryan Couture, like, because obviously Couture is un- weirdly a much less good fighter now than he was here. Mm-hmm. I mean, he almost, yeah. you know, he got cracked. He, he did not want to trade punches with a like 42 year old dude who only grapples in his last bout. Yeah. And uh the the thing that you you see here is very much the what it looks like when a fighter is still confident that they can't be knocked out. Mm. Yeah. Like the young the young fighter's confidence of eat, being able to just eat these shots and keep coming after somebody. Mhm. Katori is actually outboxing Cajun Ninja right now. <laughs> he's <Yep. laughs> he's landing combinations. He's all, I think it's also because, like, again, KJ is constantly tr- – like, everything he does is – every fight is – Head kick KJ flush. Yeah. Yeah. Every fight he's like, okay, I've guessed about the one thing they're going to do to me. I'm going to use my one boxing technique to stop it. And that's this yep. fight. But now that Couture is, like, pressuring and mixing in kicks and throwing more than one punch, it's like KJ can't even box anymore. He's still just looking for that thing, one like, counter. Couture's style was just naturally – naturally great for hiding the fact that he was pretty badly hurt for good portions of that last round. Because <laughs> like, with anyone like else, else, they'd be like, this guy's staggering all over the cage. He's <laughs> fucked up. Brian <laughs> <laughs> Couture just like, maybe that's just who he is. Brian Couture goes out with his friends and they constantly think he's trying to get into fights at bars, but really he's just <laughs> drunk. And the moment he starts wobbling and his legs aren't steady, it looks like his fighting stance. It's like, all right, calm down, Ryan, calm down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody hold him back. Somebody hold him back. <laughs> Getting agitated. He can barely stand. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, man. You know, this is what I mean. Like, KJ Noons, as much as I enjoy his highlights, he, he, there, <laughs> there are reasons he lost a fight like this. Yeah. I'm yeah. totally even watching it and even having said in round two, wait, <laughs> Ryan Couture wins this fight. I still feel fine with it. Watching it yeah. now. Well, he's just... Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is great right hook that clips KJ on the chin because he's just kind of standing there going what is this what this is yeah I think this plays to Phil's point though that like a, a lot of the subtlety trained in for boxing does yeah. not it doesn't have a chance to come through in MMA yeah because K- so much KJ of it is like strike you as a guy who has really learned like boxing systemics 
and then is in an MMA fight, all the other options are like, whoa, what? No. Right. So he's just like even his boxing becomes shitty. Yeah. He's yeah. just lunging around, everything's wild and looping. Because he's he's really he, he really bought into the systemic yeah. like reactions yeah. and punches of boxing. And maybe that's why MMA seems to encourage pressure fighting so much. Like there's just too much shit to worry about if you're going to be reactive and defensive. So it makes more sense to make the other guy worry about it. Uh huh. Or yep. why, you know, your counter fighters in MMA are incredibly risk averse to the point of just yeah. sit and wait and sit and wait. Yeah. Although I bet you Hoff Ellison Sal could win a few 10 round boxing matches if he trained for it. Probably. Somebody yeah. like that. It's just like really yep. patient, really disciplined. Doesn't care about winning rounds or exchanges. <laughs> or just fell face first into Le a jab there. Leapt into a jab. <laughs> oh, boy. This is like, we're agreed this is the greatest striking performance of Ryan Couture's career, right? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yes. Unquestionably. Like, this, is, this is amazing. This is like, <laughs> this is Jardine and, uh, and, uh, Newton esque at uh, points. It, it, it's if Keith Jardine and Jake Shields had a baby. <laughs> Jake Jardine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he just gets. That's, that's the thing. <laughs> he, he occasionally lands something really hard, but then, like, there's something just something <laughs> weird will be coming back at him so quickly that he's just he's just clearly so visibly upset by it. <laughs> what was that? It was just sort of skidded sideways. And both guys throw their arms in the air. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> this fight. This is my triumph. Oh, oh boy. Which you gotta love how like cause, you know it's also very probably much probably very much speaks to KJ's status as sort of the Jorge Masvidal. If I won the exchanges, it doesn't matter how the, how the round's going kind of fighter. Yeah. yeah. Because he has that same Masvidal kind of reaction of like, I firmly won that fight that I did not really do very well in at all. So, so to tie it into May May Mayweather McGregor, did KJ have that ability as a boxer? Is this something that is common in boxing? And did it go away in MMA? Did it, did he become the kind of guy who, you know what I mean? Oh, I, th yeah. I think it it probably serves boxers a lot better, honestly. Yeah. Because there's such a more limited sphere. I mean, did KJ ever fight at the kind of level where it would have mattered in boxing? No, but I'm just wondering. Like once once all of the options um, available to his opponents in MMA it became a thing he had to deal with, did he? Did he then become the kind of fighter who like didn't realize he was losing exchanges and couldn't tell when when rounds were slipping away or how the fight was playing out as a whole, or was he like that as a boxer and it just works for boxers? I, my guess would be it just works better for boxers. Yeah, because I think it's just a it's just a way of thinking, like just a a way of that you built, you know, that fighters have. It's it kind Any, of anyone who's trained has experienced it. Like you go into a sparring match, it ends and it take it takes either half an hour or 30 seconds to finish and you have no idea what happened. Like that's everyone's done that. Yeah. If they've, uh, I mean, I think that that'd, that'd always be a basic issue that, you know, KJ is just like clearly it, a woefully unadaptable fighter. Mm. Like I think, I think yeah. that probably would have, that probably would have, uh, yeah, because that's the thing, right? Is he's not just a boxer. He's not just can, a boxer who. Box, uh, yeah, you go can on, make Phil. boxing for MMA work. Like, yeah, he's not just wanna, a boxer really who's just tried MMA. Yeah. He's been doing this for years and has never changed his game a bit. So yeah, maybe it's more evident that he just probably, even as a boxer, would never have gone that far. He's very upset about this decision, by the way. He's yeah. he's really really upset about it. Poor KJ. He's back at a timeout for that uh, <laughs> for that display. I mean, you know, that's I think the thing too of like you get a fighter like him who you know I think he started as a pro when he was like seventeen. Like he, KJ Newton yeah. is only thirty four. Yeah, and he started kickboxing in two thousand and turned that into MMA and turned that into boxing pretty quickly afterward. Mm -hmm. 
So you get that, the young veteran kind of attitude of like <laughs> Phil was Phil was going to comment saw, on. Saw, like, we saw Couture jumping up and down at the end. Yeah. At which moment I like to think that he'd suddenly freeze and then turn into like a multicolored poor <laughs> like ninety <90 laughs> CGI effect and then find himself, you know, find himself inhabiting like uh, Mussolini's some... body now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So I imagined. I looked before... at the. Go on, yeah. We'll start. Before we get too deep into this, let's start the next fight. We can get back into yep. it. Okay. All right. But N- Nishijima, Pride 31, Dreamers, starting in three, two, one, go. I imagined when I saw the look of relief on Ryan Katora's face as the decision was announced that that was the moment that the, the Quantum Leaper left his body. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> suddenly yeah. left... <laughs> Oh, another great fight, I guess. <laughs> Boy, that adrenaline, I don't remember it at all. Ryan Couture is like a beast in the gym and has no idea that he looks like a terrified quantum leaper every time he fights. <laughs> <laughs> just somebody else doing it for him. Uh, so Nishijima here, a pretty reasonable boxer by standards. You know, he had, he had a 24-2-1 uh, and one pro career as a boxer. And uh, let's see, was a WBO NABO cruiserweight champion. Uh, you know, some some alphabet championships to his name. And this fight comes 2006, well after his pro boxing career, which went from 1992 to 2003. So it's kind of. He's kind of abdicating his responsibilities again. I guess. What the hell is he? This is, this is disgraceful. It is. You ready for the... You, you here for your job, Connor? We're, I'm here, here for my job, Zane. Okay. Here okay. we go. Round one begins right now. So I, I just gave so and Nishijima's in shoes for this. So he gets yeah, nice. the full boxing shoes. He's got his boxing trunks. I just gave some context. He was a pretty good boxer, an alphabet title boxer for in the nineties. This is after his pro boxing career. And, you know, we're talking early MMA career Mark Hunt, which is basically just a kickboxer. Yeah. So it's basically just a an open weight kickboxing match with a gigantic heavyweight fighting a, I mean, I know Hunt is a short heavyweight, but he must have at oh. least 50 pounds on Nishijima here, if not much more. Oh. Mark Hunt with the, <laughs> the natural MMA fighter takedown. Yep. Yeah. The, I like I just, did, did, did anyone see Nog in the background just laughing at that? <laughs> He's in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> just cracking up at how easy the takedown was. <laughs> Yeah, so this is uh, Nishijima's going to have to look out here on the ground because Hunt could leg lock him with those boxing shoes on. <laughs> he really could. <laughs> Hunt could go for that inverted heel hook. Similarly, though, Hunt's got to watch out. He's got the ankle wrap and the, the taped up ankle wrap. So, you Nishijima, know, he's put himself in some danger, too. Nishijima has trained all the MMA moves the side check kick. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you know, all of them. He knows he'll knee bar Hunt if he's not careful. Oh, Hunt in prime position for a smother here. Mm. I wish we had a TKO via smother at one of our... Uh, We need to have one someday on this show. Yeah, we do. So part of the reason, too, I I chose this fight is here we are in round one of Hunt firmly dominating. This is a three-round fight. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I've never watched this before. He does like... uh, Seems like Hunt should win this by stoppage quite <laughs> shortly. Yeah. He he does actually How like does he doesn't he not win. He doesn't spend the whole fight on top of Nishijima, uh, and you will be astounded. You it, it is a good fight, by the way, to prove that <laughs> boxers take punches better than MMA fighters. Uh, <clears throat> they see shit coming and they roll with it or they brace for it way way better even in an MMA uh, rule set. So we're going to see Nishijima absorb, <laughs> a, <laughs> absorb a terrible amount of punishment in this That fight. lazy way, Hunt just like <laughs> launches, slouches down onto him. 
like it's like a like human like... bar stool. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <sighs> Not really rolling with those very well, but hey, hey got up. Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. He had to improvise it, and it was against somebody who doesn't really know how to grapple at this point, but pretty good. You see, Nishijima's got that KJ Noon style. Oof. Oof. And he's getting beat in the same way, like, Hunt is doing the Ryan Couture offense in there. Yeah. Like, uh, oh. Hunt is Hunt was smart enough to start off his first strike that he threw was a leg kick. <laughs> Man, it's so... I, I really wish that, like, this version of Mark Hunt had ha- taken his career more seriously at this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like the speed and power that he's throwing everything in there. It's just, right. oh, Hunt was Hunt was shockingly fast before like the last two or three years. He was really really quick for uh, a guy with his build. Nishijima this, did get in. His hand speed yes. here makes you realize even how much faster <laughs> he used to be. Yeah, Nishijima got in some good jabs. Yeah. Uh, so like at space, he does have something to offer. Yeah, he, he he I mean he's you know, he's clearly a good pro boxer working yeah. in an MMA fight against somebody way bigger than him. Yeah, it's yeah, like how it, much he's trained MMA. Like cuz he, yeah. he uh, this, this is mean, the era uh this is his first MMA fight. He he lost all of them. And this is very firmly the oh, man. Oh, 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 that right yeah. hand and knee combo. It's just Yeah. And this is very firmly the Pride era where they were really good at convincing Ooh. dudes that they should just give MMA a shot. Mm-hmm. Where you had your like Olympic judokas who would show up in the gi and like be pulling the gi off halfway through the fight as they got their ass handed to them. You can also see, by the way, the quality of Hunt's boxing in this fight. Yeah. Like Nishijima's got a great jab, but Hunt has a very good jab of his own. He just landed two really nice counters. Like, he's starting to take away Nishijima's left, which is like, really the only weapon he's got. You want to look at a great boxing oh. or MMA? Oh. Ooh. And it has to be Mark Hunt, right? Like, that's what I'm talking about. Nishijima stepped in with a jab. Hunt cross-countered, came back with the hook, and dropped him with a knee. Yeah. Like, he, he, he beat him on boxing before he put him down. Granted, Hunt, again, is like... 100 pounds heavier than Nishijima. So. But we have years and years of data on Hunt. Oh, he, all, he just tried to head stomp him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, oh. Uh, but we have years of data to tell us that Hunt's boxing adaptations to MMA are really, really good. Yeah. And they were good in kickboxing, too. He had very good hands as a K1 fighter as well. I remember his knockout of uh, Jerome LeBanner. And he just mowed LeBanner down in the corner with ha- combinations. Oh yeah, his issue. Oh. His issue. Oh. Was branded. That that little hook was beautiful. beautiful little counter hook. Beautiful beauty. Marciano there, shot to the back of the head. I like that. <laughs> he oh. dropped a right hand right on the base of uh, Nishijima's neck. My God, man. The chin on this guy. Right. That's what I'm yeah, talking about, though. It's also like... I mean, this must just, have put serious damage on him. Yeah, but boxers just know how to take punches. Like, that's the thing that people um, think is, is fooey. Like, oh, their chins don't get better because they use them more, but they don't get surprised by punches. I, I would also, what do you think of this argument that boxing self-selects for good chins better than MMA does? Probably. That's a good point. Because you're a good boxer, you gotta have a good chin. Yeah, like yeah. you just cannot be a reasonably good pro boxer without a good yeah. chin. You can't be an elite MMA fighter without a good chin, but you can't even be like a reasonable pro boxer without one. Yeah. You can be a reasonable MMA fighter without a good. I mean, you can be Alistair Overeem with a bad chin and still be a very good heavyweight MMA. I mean, fighter. You, you have shaky chins. Like you, you could be a, a a Wilfred Benitez and not take a great shot, but be a brilliant defensive fighter in boxing. But for the most you part, have to like, be a brilliant defensive fighter. Alistair yeah. Overeem is not a brilliant defensive fighter, and he's still an amazing top heavyweight yeah. without a good chin. Whatever the response is, you're going to have to deal with someone standing very close to you and hitting you, trying to hit you with lots of punches. Yeah. So either a chin or a phenomenal defense, you need something. Hunt is just using his size here, just. Nishijima looks like he's in terrible discomfort. <laughs> Hunt's I mean, going for an Americana. 
Nishijima, he's not just like the thing. He hasn't just taken punches, though. I mean, and a lot of a lot of it is like you yeah. said. It's the kind of shock of of taking things you're not ready for. He's taken some horrific knees to the body and head, and, and, and now like, this the ultimate insult, just Hunt grinding his crotch right in his face. Yeah, <laughs> just... seeming <laughs> seems to be Mark's goal with this position. In fact, I is... would not be. <laughs> I mean, this is a dude who did an atomic butt drop in a fight. There's, you know, would you be at all surprised if he was just rubbing himself on him just a little? He's going for a something. He's going for He's an going Americana. For an Americana kind of key lock. He's going for what I like to call the strongman arm subs. Yeah, it's sort of a Kimura. Just yeah, he's looking <laughs> for a Kimura, but he doesn't have the angle right. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, man. He's going for a Kimura from the wrong side because he was trying to get it from north-south and then he got really yeah. fixated on that arm, so he kept trying to get it even after he ended up in side control. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Jumping double knee drop. Oh, my God. Nishijima <laughs> got up with such fear. <laughs> Hunt probably getting a little tired right now. Hunt, this yep. is bad out-of-shape Hunt when he decided to try MMA. Yeah, th this is definitely core, like... Not Ooh. really in shape, but it's also the hunt style of like being still being a good enough at con conserving energy to know exactly how to fight out when he's really tired, especially against somebody who doesn't want to take him down. Anyone else been spotting any of the, the people in the background as well? You can see Overeem in the orange shirt with the Dutch colors in the, in the background there. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, I haven't been looking, but. Now He's peering, yeah. peering cur curiously at the ring. Thinking one oh, day I'm going to get Bruce Lever Doom right. back there on the left. Yeah, Hunt yep. is definitely in better shape now in his 40s than he was in this fight. Yeah, yeah. Like at least in terms of his ability to maintain like a pace. Well, and and just his his gut fitness, like those love handles and yeah. belly. That is. More out of shape than Hunt is. Shijima right starting to box him up a little bit. Yeah, Gomi's Hunt's getting tired. Into it. You don't. You don't want to get into a po pocket boxing match if you don't have the energy to uh, react. This is a weird ass fight. Yeah, sure is. It is good one though. Interesting. Yeah. Very very strange. Yeah. Mostly, I'm impressed by how incredibly tough Nishijima is. Right, but. Yeah. Like I said, I'm, I'm figuring he was never this tough again. Yeah. I mean, this is after his boxing career was already over, and then he went on to yeah. lose all of his MMA fights, and uh, this is the longest MMA fight he had. Mm. Mm. Ed Fedor sitting next to Hendo, I think, back there. It's always weird, like, seeing these guys in the background. You're like, oh, yeah, that guy fought. Eventually, that guy would fight that guy, and that guy would fight mm -hmm. that guy. And this guy would never fight this guy. The jab of Nishijima really is pretty, man. Yeah. But but like Hunt, yeah. Hunt, Hunt's counters to that jab were probably his best <laughs> moment in that round. <laughs> I like how Hunt's chin gets caught on the top yeah. row. Yeah. He almost decapitated himself. Yeah, I, I love that. Like, oh, it, it's very clear at every point in Mark oh, in Mark Hunt's career. I mean, the, one of the things it's too bad that he didn't get to just stay in Pride rules forever. Because it's always clear that Mark Hunt, like, and probably due to his upbringing, is a very willing sociopath in the in the <laughs> ring. Yeah, he, he would. He, like, he'd, he'd like to spend more fight time doing weird, silly shit and humiliating people. Well, or just like nearly killing them. Like this <laughs> might kill you if I land it. Like he jumped <laughs> and landed, tried to do a double like drop knee on this dude. And just you know, <laughs> it just he would land on him, and just Nishijima's head pops off his body and flies into the crowd. He could have he could have murdered a man with that move. Yeah, and you know, afterward he'd be like, "Well, I I, I didn't want to kill him. Um, obviously <laughs> that wasn't the goal, but uh, obviously Jesus and my family and everyone back home. <laughs> you don't want to get me doing an Australian accent, Zane." <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I don't. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it's my cunt. Hello. <laughs> Oh Jesus! I've, I've taxed my own Australian accent to its absolute limits, and you're not allowed at all. Your old friend Mark Hunt is here. <laughs> Hello. No. Oh, no. Sorry, I've been <laughs> first. Mayweather McGregor has already driven me insane, and now these fights are just <laughs> compounding it. This is actually like the striking portions of this fight are pretty damn enjoyable, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing these two trade punches is a lot of fun. That's the thing. Like Nishijima, you can imagine Nishijima having exactly the same fight that KJ Noons just had with somebody like Ryan Couture because yep. when Hunt agrees to box with him, he has a lot of moments. But the moment things start to mix up and he's expecting boxing and something else happens, he's just off his game. Yeah. Look, nice left hand from Nishijima, though, man. He's yeah. getting in some very good shots. I mean, you can see, like, he's he's a much more willing adapter to boxing than Noons is, or to MMA yeah. boxing. Like, he's For actually sure. step in and lead with combinations. Yeah. Granted, he he is also fighting someone who's uh, mostly throwing punches at him. True, true. Whereas Couture just refused to throw any punches at all until the third round. It's it's like the heavyweight equivalent of Ryan Couture that he could fight. <laughs> Um, think. Well, Nishijima is probably not a heavyweight. So, who's yeah, the middleweight point. equivalent of Ryan Couture? There's lots of them, actually. Now that I think of it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. At that point, I mean, you, you could have your, uh, you know, Dan Kelly out there. Nish- Nishijima versus Rafael Natal. <laughs> like he's better than Ryan Couture, but I think I, I think Dan Kelly is the Dan Kelly is probably the best yeah. the best option here. You can imagine me, Nishijima me. with six months of sprawl training beating what, Dan oh, Kelly. Who? What about Gerald Mearshart? Yeah, that's pretty solid because he's mostly grappler. Uh, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a good shout. I think Nishijima could knock out Gerald Mearshart on a good day. Yeah, Mearshart's tough as hell, maybe. True. But then again, he's a tough yeah. as hell guy who spent his career being hit by MMA fighters. True. Oh, man. Just... Ugh. Combos from Hunt. Yeah. Like this, this is a great reminder to me too of you know somebody asked me or somebody put on Twitter. Oh, oh. <laughs> stop! T- somebody put on Twitter not long ago like your your favorite five MMA fighters. You know, not having anything to do with skill. What are they? And Hunt is absolutely one of them. Like Hunt is one of the dudes that I will always just show up for. Yeah, I'm because. With you. Watching like the way he fights when he's at his best is just so much fucking fun. Yeah, I love that little sequence before uh, before Nishijima went down. Hunt ended up not quite in a clinch, but inside, and he had a good angle. He was positioned so his left side was just lined up with the center of Nishijima's body, and he just just poked him with like four consecutive jabs, like this this sort of casual, yeah, natural feel for where his opponent is and what openings are, are available to him that Hunt has. It, it really does speak to like genuine striking skill, a lot of skill. And yeah. this is a dude who, you know, like started striking in, just started doing any combat sports in his early twenties, I think. Yeah. Yeah. A very unlikely K one winner, an unlikely UFC contender. Like this kind of stuff. We're going to see some like yeah. that. Look at that. Oh, Uses his elbow, yeah. creates just a little bit of space, quick turn, hits the right hand. And I, I've also always loved Mark Hunt's, uh, well, I called it the Samoan shell when I wrote about it a long time ago. <laughs> but like head down, arms over the body, take everything on the forehead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh. These exchanges. Not exchanges anymore, Jesus Christ. No, Hunt's getting uh, serious. He wants this over and see, look at that left hand. Like his position is so good. Left hook, jab off of it. He's it's always Oh my god. Oh. This is this could be stopped, honestly. <laughs> it could have yeah. been stopped a while ago. Yeah. Nishijima's still trying though, man. This is, he is. this is very pride. It yes. is. Like I say, they had that thing where they just they could convince they could pay these guys enough to like just go in there and give this a shot, try taking this MMA fight. See, Hunt, the, Hunt doesn't actually have like 
he just uh-huh. like his way of resting is to let you hit his chin a few times <laughs> while he catches his breath. Oh, and the the violence coming off of it is just the the, yeah. the thing is though it's like it's such a trick because you want to hit him. Right. And then the violence that comes back off of it is just so severe. He, he reminds me, even though he's so different in stature, uh, he reminds me of like big George Foreman in his second mm-hmm. career run. Yeah. Where like he would constantly do things or he would just hit somebody and just the moment he hit them, they didn't, they hadn't even reacted yet. He hadn't had time to see how the punch scored already. He had dropped his hands. He was like walking away. And that person was just slowly crumpling to the ground. Like, <laughs> That's a very Mark Hunt thing, is this very casual... Yeah, yep. This casual appearance with great, great potential for violence. He he just looks very comfortable in a fight, Mark Hunt. There needs to be, like, a study of, like, you know, the the fat dude style of fighting. (laughs) There are some great fat fighters, man. Yeah. This like, I want to see these left hooks and jabs again from Hunt. So he always got his his left shoulders always nice and lined up. He's off to the side a little bit, like he's out positioning Nishijima here. Not now, but he's going to come back and he's going to get head position. He's going to come back around to his right and line up that left hand, like that. That's a good angle. Yeah, so he's always looking for that moment when he can step just to your side and face you when you're not facing him, and he can just tee off, like that. Com- see. The combinations he throws too, they just they seem like it's such a natural, like yeah. fluid style of combination. Like he's it a very organic fighter. Yeah, like yeah. it doesn't seem like, oh, I spent all this time training these combinations. It's just, well, I was rolling this way, so I'm gonna punch, you know, swing this arm right. into this point. I'm rolling the other way now, come back with something else. And it's just that very yeah, and he motion. never, he never, he almost never puts 100% into a, into a single shot. No. Like, I mean, that's his, you know, his special ability, his ability to kind of play off his speeds of his, or now, like, one to two different speeds of his left hand. And, and, you know, he can just play off that left hand and then suddenly the right comes behind it eventually. Mm-hmm. He's, oh. you know, he's very much a kind of tap tap. He just he, crash with his. That was a great example of it. Yep. He just he waited for Nishijima to move to his right so he could line him up for the right hand. But in the meantime, he was just putting nothing on a series of jabs just to get him to move. Yeah, he's he's very he's more like as a striking specialist who came to MMA. Like Hunt is more what you should expect from a good boxer coming to yeah. MMA and taking it seriously. Is like. The things that stand out are the fact that he sees his shots and picks them according to what openings are available. He's not throwing pre-written combinations. He's not doing pre-ordained defensive reactions. He's just watching. Well, and, and the fun thing you can see in a fight like this is that it's, it's it's something I think that we've gotten we've unfortunately missed out on as Hunt has gotten older because him being tired means more than it used to. But you know, he be, he becomes a more technical fighter the more tired he gets. Mm-hmm. Like as he's slowing oh. down. <laughs> Just to, I mean, it came like three minutes too late, but uh, thankfully it came at some point. My God. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, that's Hunt was gassed at the end of the first round of this fight. Yeah, that's the thing. Like he still beat the shit out of Nishima for t- for ten more minutes after exhausting himself. And it's he just gets more technical because then it's like, oh well, I'll just make everything soft, go easy, just yeah. roll through, and just oh. You can also when it like when you're fighting a boxer, like he treats the clinch as a place to rest in a way, and you can treat it that way, and you can rest in between exchanges, you can move and yep. get into a rhythm. Like there are certain things that MMA fighters probably have a much harder time of doing. Uh, because there's just not as like there's there's always something to strain against. Yeah. Yep. Or more, more frequently, anyway. Boy, what a brutal fight. Yes. Yeah. Man. That was incredibly vicious. Y'all ready for another fat guy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the fattest. <laughs> the fattest. I, I want to see a replay of that one punch. Sure, if I yeah. 
wait for it, but hopefully they get to it quickly. It's prime. Takibara right? being like, yes, I sanctioned this murder. <laughs> <laughs> I asked this man to go through this punishment. He says with a smile on his face. This will not be in my most top in my top 10 most amoral bookings. <laughs> yeah. Just caught him on the temple even. Yeah, didn't yeah. even catch him like through a glove even. Yeah, like I think one knuckle just caught him past the glove. He, but he yeah, was on the thing a weirdly is like, good stoppage. Right. right? Yeah. Like, after after that second round, yeah, like he's <laughs> that's that's a, the, the post fight a... interview right there. Did you see that? What did he say? <laughs> I don't know what he said. It's just one word. Like does somebody put the mic up? He's like, yeah. <laughs> Walked he off. said, he said, Gato. He said <laughs> hello, and then left. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> move on from your terrible <laughs> mark. Right. You're worse than mine, and mine was awful. Okay. Listen. Listen. <laughs> now we have Butterbean versus Rob Broughton in Cage Rage 19. So, ready for this, everybody? I'm ready. Starting in three, two, one, go. Oh, can, we have got Butter can we have gotten Butterbean at Genki Sudo? Uh, you, you know, this fight. Always did they not have that one? Well, they had it, I'm sure. But. This lasted. I, I felt like this would be more painful. I think it it lasts <laughs> longer. Oh boy! <laughs> Look at the <laughs> <laughs> these two dudes posing. <laughs> Rob Rotten looked so frightened and like uncomfortable. <laughs> Butter. Oh man! <laughs> I'm give you a generous shot of that gut. <laughs> You know, I just realized, too, he looks like Alex Jones. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be... Oh, well, he really does. As Broughton submits him, he's going to be, Globalist! The globalist <laughs> is submitting me! <laughs> oh, he really does. <laughs> sort of like a really fat hybrid of, yeah, Alex Jones and sort of Fedor. Yeah. <laughs> like... One bowl of chili uh, is enough to get Alex Jones to forget his children's birthdays. 20 bowls of chili is enough to get him to fight Rob Broughton. <laughs> it's the expanding brain, Alex Jones. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is galaxy brain, Alex Jones. <laughs> He's just galaxy. Well, maybe Alex he was just Jones. like, maybe he was just like a warped clone that one of, you know, one of the Hillary, like one of, one of Hillary's uh, like secrets secret genetic engineering facilities tried to build of him they were trying to make it and it would be the one that would replace him and then you know, <laughs> spread, spread the goat globalist message to the world info wars is actually moon but with conspiracy theories instead of oxygen mining <laughs> <laughs> like they just unfreeze a new alex jones clone every two years and <laughs> he has to like go through and re relive the same con just conspiracy theories so this is this is the one that went rogue. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. the rogue Alex Jones. <sighs> oh boy! But really, well, Butterbean gonna fight. Yeah, I mean, let, just just so you don't disparage boxing as a sport, uh, Butterbean doesn't represent boxing coming into MMA. He's a performance artist, in a way. You know, it's uh, it's all it's all a joke. So if he happens to look really terrible or talk about Nazis. It's performance art. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. No, I mean, Butterbean, not actually a Nazi. Let's get that out there for anybody no, who may have been not. confused here. But Butterbean's probably a lovely man. I think he is. Oh, oh Lord. Awesome. Butterbean is so great because it's like his torso makes his arms so wide set that he can't throw a straight punch. Like, there's no way for him to line up his shoulder with the target and mm. throw a shot straight down the pipe. Look, like, look. <laughs> his elbows can't come down to rest at his sides. Those, those last two are, like, things. Those are sped up, right? <laughs> I think they are, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Fearless. Here we go. Now, I will say this. 
if, if a man looking like Butterbean confronted you somewhere, you'd be terrified, right? Oh yeah. Oh, I mean yeah. he looks he looks like one of the villains from uh Spawn. The like spawn yeah. cartoon on HBO. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he really does. Put a put a horn on Butterbean's head and he looks like a teenage mutant ninja turtles villain easily. Yeah. Just one rhino horn, that's all you need. So yeah, and I was gonna say too, Butterbean has been fighting long enough. Like I was a big boxing fan back when Butterbean was fighting. Like I yeah. remember watching Butterbean fights on TV. Back when there were just like random TV show like, or TV cards with huge punching but not amazing heavyweight boxers like Butterbean, like well, David Tua deserves to be yep. mentioned a little more highly than Butterbean, but yeah, but that used to be a thing. I mean, how many? This how guy many pro punches. boxing bouts did Butterbean actually have? Because it must be like eighty. I, th- I thought it was like, like thirty or forty or something. It's eighty. No, he definitely had. That. He had, he had 90, seventy by the time he fought Holmes in two thousand two. Really? Yeah, there you go. Won. Wow. Yeah. He boxed Respect. all the way up until twenty thirteen. Respect, Seven, man. Seventy-seven, ten, and four. Look at the. He's off the screen. On the, <laughs> on the presentation. And his arm just, yeah, his arm is just gone. He is simply now, he's reached his final form of just being a sphere of flesh. <laughs> I couldn't have just sized Butterbean down a bit to make him. No. Fit. Oh my God. Every, every Halloween, he puts on a whole bunch of bronzer and goes his meat wad. Oh, what a fucking farce. Oh, I'm ready. I'm so ready for this fight right now. <laughs> somehow, somehow, Butterbean's trunks are like a normal man's pants, even though he's like very short. <laughs> they start like halfway up his torso, and they go way past his knees. Here's the question: Does Butterbean look kind of in better shape than Rob Broughton? <laughs> Rob Broughton looks so silly coming into this fight. He walked. He, Rob Broughton is not an athletic man. I'll say that. <laughs> He he's oh, as man. far as athleticism is concerned, Butter Butterbean is miles beyond him. Oh, so Broughton getting the immediate takedown has Butterbean in the fat man tipped over position. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, mean, I mean, this is this is the issue, right? Is that is that he's basically trying to grapple a weeble here. <laughs> Like it's like it's like where's the center of gravity? It's right in the middle. Like you can't really tip him over in any given direction because because he can just roll right through because he is basically just an ovoid. <laughs> That's uh, true. It, He's surprisingly slippery on the ground. Here's <laughs> like, the classic what I like to call lost in the three way position. <laughs> yeah. The classic "please don't make eye contact" position. Like they got they they got tangled up in the bed sheet, and you know, like the woman so, stepped out for like some coffee twenty minutes ago, and they didn't notice. She comes back in the room, yeah. and that's when they realize they've been grappling with each other. But exactly. watching Butterbean stand up just then, I mean, you could not have possibly expected this man to grapple. He couldn't, like, Broughton was three feet uh, away and he had a hard time standing up. <laughs> he tried to uh, kick a kick. Of course he did. <laughs> they both laughed about it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. He's basically is- a, I don't, and I, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but he's basically like, he's a Sontaran from Doctor Who. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Oh, he really is. You're too cool to get that reference, actually. No, you're don't not. I, don't I, <laughs> no, I'm not. But I don't know Doctor <laughs> Who. The thing, the thing too here, like, um, this is kind of oh, the kind of shit Butterbean maybe could get away with in boxing because uh, the fence is a lot less forgiving than the ropes. Yeah, in certain ways, like in some ways, it's great, but you can't like you can stick your butt out between ropes. Or mm-hmm. lean your head back way over them and rely on the tension to keep you up. And the cage just is a wall. It just stops you. You can also use the ropes to absorb shock. Yeah. Like you can bounce into them and like right. with something. You can't do that with the cage, really. It's just right. kind of a wall. <laughs> <laughs> but a pain went for a triangle. <sighs> it was more of a He's... kind of I'm gonna try and sort of put my legs around this guy ish. 
<sighs> this fight doesn't end here. This fight doesn't end with yeah. this. Well, I mean, but this is the problem: is that is that Butterbean is so biologically he is biologically made to be unhurtable. You, you can't submit him because he's got no neck. Showed of the guy you that, like how you have to build people to survive a car crash. <laughs> yes, he yeah. looks what humans he's will look like in in that. twenty years. <laughs> yeah. Like 500 years from now, all people will look like Butterbean because he's unkillable. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good yeah, point. Like He's so deceptively hard with no MMA skills whatsoever to outgrapple him because he's just, he's just a, a weird shape. He's just a very yeah. strange shape. And you can't get him off you if he gets this position. Like, Does Butterbean have any wins via smother? Like, I bet you he does. You would think. Oh, you can only hope so. I'm looking it up. Yeah, I mean, how do you how do you submit someone whose arms are like two feet tall and uh, two foot well, long and, and like a foot wide? Too, like you see him in that position where he's like covering up, kind of. His his pecs are so meaty. You can't actually slip yeah. in that under uppercut that goes in in up between somebody's <clears throat> guard when they're on the yeah. Ground. It just hits, like peck. There's no opening. <laughs> I, w- I don't know if that's pec, Zane. It's man boob. Man boob. Uh, it's attached to the pecs. It, 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 yeah. He's got a moob defense. It's armor. It's yes. extra armor. <laughs> a moob defense. Let's uh, see. Like, I mean, that's the thing. Like, how in, in his combat sports career, how often was Butter being finished? Like, uh, I mean, Minowa submitted him. Spoilers, Rob Broughton submitted him. So did Genki Sudo. Tengi. Did Genki Sudo actually submit him? Yeah, Genki I Sudo submitted him via heel hook in the second round. Here's the thing. He's only, but he only got knocked out twice in boxing. Yeah. Yeah. Only lost by, I mean, by knockout twice. Never lost. No, only lost by knockout in MMA once, but lost all of his MMA fights by finish, by submission. I mean, the leg, have... going for the legs makes sense because that's the most, like, traditionally human part of his body. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, other than that, like... That's I mean, why the shorts like, are so long. He wants to hide I the fact like, that he has human legs attached to his torso. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, we, it's his weak spot, you know. Right. You can't, like, yeah, I mean, I guess Blade finished him, but he had to use, like, those sun lamps to do it. <laughs> 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 Oh God! <laughs> do you think Do you think Butterbean would survive if you dropped a bunker buster directly on him? <laughs> <laughs> I think he might. <laughs> I think it would bounce off of him before it blew up. No, oh, I think he could literally just get that move in the way and really deflect <laughs> most of the damage. Oh, you gotta love him. Just look at him. He's just a happy-go-lucky guy. That oh, Butterbean. Yeah. He's yeah. enjoying this. Sure, he's getting paid to just basically not be able to be killed. Well, that that idea too of like you know how they say you get a lot of knockout. Uh, what gets you knocked out and what gets you concussed is like the whiplash as your neck spins. Yeah, he doesn't have a neck. Yeah, he's his head yeah. is sunk literally into his torso. What if instead of pointing at a wet spot in the canvas, there Butterbean was pointing at a spot where his foot had just gone through the plywood? <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh <laughs> the ring is broken. Oh, you, you know what he's built like? You know what it is? What huh. cuz you brought up the Ninja Turtles thing. So remember I I think was it Ninja Turtles or was it Captain Planet? The guy who had the head, there was the brain in a gut. <laughs> like Krang. Oh, that was Turtles. Yeah. Krang. Krang. Yeah. He's built like Krang but with the brain head is just like like yeah. there's no head on top. It's just the brain in the yeah, gut. just in the shoulders. <laughs> he's not just a fat guy. Like, he's so broad. Look at his back. Yeah. He's he's such a strange man. And Rob Broughton is having a devilishly hard time figuring out how to beat this man who can't grapple. <laughs> but Butterbean is also just taking jabs from Rob Broughton. How does yeah, he even like, defend his face? He doesn't. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. He's got, yeah, he's got no like. Can he? He just can't put his hands up there. He can't reach like, his face. Like, like, his shoulders are set too far away from his chin. 
Oh man, I love him. He had ninety pro boxing bouts. <laughs> <You're> what? <right. laughs> I closed all of them. <laughs> they weren't against very good fighters, but still, he did beat Larry Holmes, as Phil has pointed out a few times. And even if they're against bad boxers, the dude who looks like that, like, I mean, you don't ever give any credence to his ability to beat even bad boxers, you know? Yeah. 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 I imagine he surprised a shitload of people. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so he knocked, yeah, he knocked, I think he knocked down Larry Holmes in their, in their, like, 15th round after getting his jab, after getting his face pulverized. It's hard for me to even imagine, though, like, what, of what, based on what Butterbean I've seen, how could Eric Esch go 14 rounds and survive Larry Holmes' jab? That is literally the reason why I'm picking Conor McGregor to survive against. (laughs) I'm not joking. That that fight, I'm going to reference it in our breakdown. That fight is the reason why I'm picking Conor McGregor to go the distance. Because Butterbean went the distance against Larry Holmes. Because I, don't, I don't have to justify it. Oh, man. So, I mean, but I think, really, if you distill it, this is going to be, like, I think we've done a good job picking fights that really preview the Mayweather-McGregor. Yeah. Yeah. There are yeah. a lot of different, I, I think we've found a lot of angles, uh, How how, like, cross sport fights reflect the big cross sport fight we're about to see my god i mean, <laughs> I mean my god <laughs> also also a lot of magic spells too mm-hmm. angles mm-hmm. and magic yep. spells <laughs> yep so Rob brown trying to sort of turn the corner but he doesn't realize there's no corner to be had <laughs> it's all spin <laughs> no can't turn a corner if there's no corner and then he taps out this straight. Oh man! And Rob Brighton up there, like, yeah, that was yeah. not a carnival freak show. That was that. That somehow that goes on my official record. <laughs> <laughs> what was Rob Broughton's record after this? Oh, let's see. So he immediately lost to the same guy who knocked out Eric Ash. Tengiz Tedarajé. Yep. And then Rob Rodden did get to the UFC, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Had well, three UFC it. bouts, then took one fight in 2015 after being retired for four years, and lost it. He lost the decision to fill the And won it, actually. Rather, I should say. Well, what a contest. I mean, really, I've seen the best that both MMA and boxing have to offer in this one. Which brings us, of yes. course, <laughs> to... Our final fight of the evening, Randy Couture versus James Tony, The highest profile boxing MMA, probably the highest profile boxing MMA crossover bout of all time in any way. Yeah. There were some big ones um, back in the early, like turn of the 20th century, like yeah. uh, catch wrestlers, fighting boxers oh, and that sure, kind of thing. Sure, 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 sure. Don't jerk yourself off here. Come on. Hey, you said of all time, all right? Yeah, Frank, MMA, yeah. MMA, not like a, mil- a million fucking people watched. Yeah, Frank we're not, we're not, we're not counting Ali and Noki here. Yeah, that will also. I don't think anyone celebrated that. Anyway, in modern MMA history, now to have to, to have to clarify, sure for our <laughs> for our hipster pedants out there in the audience. When when did this fight take place? What year was this? Should uh, we play it first? One we hit play first. Sorry. Yeah, okay. So starting yeah, let's in get started. three, two, one, go. Okay. So I just want to kind of see what James Tony went on to do in boxing after like where was he at this point? Was this two thousand seven, eight? This was scroll, 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 Randy Couture, James Tony, two thousand ten. Okay. So this is Tony uh this is yep. Pretty near the end of his career. Definitely near the end, but still had some a few impressive wins. Like he he knocked out Bobby Gunn. After this, he let's see. Well, not a ton of great stuff after this, to be honest. Yeah, no, that, that's about it. He did go twelve rounds with Lucas Brown, a decent heavyweight. Yeah. So I mean, Who he wasn't like a came up as one of the most notable. Uh, boxers to uh, one of the most notable crossovers to go from MMA to boxing and be a very good boxer. Lucas Brown did? Yeah. 
He started in his, he started in MMA like a month before he started in boxing and had a he ran both of them together alongside each other on like the Australian regional circuit and then yeah. did much better with boxing than MMA. But because I, yeah. I was one of the things that I, I you brought up I was talking thinking about this fight earlier today. I was thinking about Mayweather McGregor, and it felt re it's kind of weird, amazingly weird to me that this is like I say this that Mayweather McGregor is the first Tony Couture moment in boxing. Yeah, I yeah, think it's so, maybe the oh, go on. Uh, so yeah, there's a there's a there's a great moment. Of, there's a great piece on uh, Deadspin by a guy called Charles Farrell, who is, is, is clearly, I think he's a boxing, prom he's been a promoter and done a whole bunch of things. Man, in, he managed uh, Freddie Norwood back in the day. Yeah. He's a, he's a, he's a, real, he's a real fun read. Uh, but he was saying how that he'd, he'd seen boxing and he'd seen MMA fighters fight. And he was utterly convinced and he knew that tony was one of the you know one of the greatest one of the you know greatest of his of his era and one of you know the best in his weight class ever and he was just like i've seen mma strikers fight there's no way an mma fighter is not going to get destroyed by a boxer and there's just this great and he's and he's he was just like he's just gonna close the distance he's gonna die and he's just so he just writes about it and he says so i was one of the many boxing people who was turned into a yokel staring slack-jawed at the TV screen as Couture, who looked middle-aged and moved with all the urgency of an armchair athlete reaching for his TV's remote control while taking down, rained harmless punches on his head, all thrown as distractions to set up his submission move, which he effortlessly applied and caused Tony to tap out barely three minutes into the match, a suddenly beached whale whose long-established persona of menace had been instantly erased. That's, yeah. It's, like, it is. This is the kind of moment where, if you were a boxing fan who didn't know anything about MMA, you would realize how much more there is, there there can be to hand to hand combat. Like you, you have no idea how easy it is for somebody like Randy Couture to just take you down if you've never had to face it before. You can't imagine it, you know. In the same way that MMA fighters cannot imagine what it feels like to take three rounds of jabs from somebody like Tevin Farmer or Gervonta Davis, or Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. And the thing is that people, you can still have the, you can still have the other perception that, you know, because distance, yeah. we all know that, like distance control, oh, wait a minute, we're about to start. Oh, you're good, you're good, you got a couple, uh, a couple seconds. Distance control is the best way of, of, of takedown, the best manner of takedown defense in, 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 you know, modern MMA. You just don't allow them to shoot. So you might be like, oh, yeah, boxers, they can use their footwork. They can use their, you know, their distance control. But unfortunately, yeah. it's first that round idea. begins. Sorry, yeah. here it is. First round begins. I know I cut you off too early, but I didn't want to wait nah. too long. Nah, we gotta, okay, James Tony's ready. First round begins now. He's ready. Okay, go so, on. So it's that idea of distance control. Is distance con the understanding of distance is the most laboriously th built thing when you build those kind of probability paths that you that you when you make a, <laughs> when you, when you learn a sport and you know, it just, it just disintegrates it, under it, when alien things happen, you can't yep. read distance when weird stuff is happening. Yeah. It's just a fact. No, literally no better objectively, no better than Butterbean at stopping a takedown. <laughs> Not even <laughs> lightly, maybe uh, even worse. Yeah. And it's I mean, James Tony. Cause Butterbean, way. Yeah, Butterbean at least. Well, I mean, because Butterbean sort of rolls rolls with it. Yeah, yeah true. Is. Well, he has no other option. He but Butterbean with can't help but roll yeah. with anything that happens. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's it, it is it it should be an eye opening moment, and I and I really do hope. Like, even though I will absolutely be electrified if McGregor wins, and it'll be the greatest upset, and it'll just be amazing. And how could you be upset with it? I hope that it's an eye-opening moment for MMA fans who don't watch boxing and don't know anything about it when they are like, oh, like, <laughs> this is what happens when you fight Floyd Mayweather and you're not a professional. Like, you know what I mean? Like, how could, yeah. looking back, how could anyone think that James Tony would come into this fight and not instantly get taken down and submitted? Because he doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, it, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't want McGregor, I don't want McGregor to win. 
Because I know. Wait, you got cut off. Why? Uh, it will be. It'll just be unbearable. It will <laughs> just. Like, yeah, that's like true. The fleeting joy of watching like Mayweather get knocked out. It would just be unbearable. It would make boxing look stupid. True. Like it would, and it would just be. It would just be a fluke. Like it. It, it would also. It would. It would also just lead to a year solid of the worst kind of "I told you so" fandom that you would you will ever hear in your life. Yeah, so, no, it would it would be the worst. Like it would be un, unbearable. The other part of this, of course, is we watch James Tony slowly getting strangled, um, <laughs> in really like the most expectable manner possible. Is that I really. I would. I don't understand the idea. Like James Tony doesn't know how to tap. People he doesn't who are, know how to tap. <laughs> you know, we we talked about this earlier. This would be the biggest upset in combat sports history, almost certainly. If yeah. McGregor won, it would be. And people who are going to be like who p- are picking him legitimately because they think no. He's going to win. It's like, is that, like, do you really want, like, that kind of insanity is just going to take all the fun out of it. Like, it just takes all the, like, I want to be yeah. that shocked when Conor yeah. Breaker wins. Because it shouldn't fucking happen. Like, you should be able to bask in the moment of, like, no, this is legitimately the most historic and unbelievable thing that we've ever seen in combat sports. And you're going to be over there like, told you so. It's like, no, come on. Yeah. It's almost unfortunate though, that it makes like any fight like this where each person like brings in this really uh, insular fan base with them. It's unfortunate that it kind of makes those fighters into like avatars of their fan bases because part of the satisfaction in seeing McGregor lose will be in seeing him humbled. But really what I'm, I'll be feeling is his fans being humbled. Like, yeah. I don't really care if McGregor's humble. I don't give a no. shit. I don't he's like, fun I don't when he's not McGregor humble. humble. He's, that, no. A humble Conor McGregor is bad for business. Yeah, and he's a worse Conor McGregor. Like, his confidence yeah. is a reason why he, he wins so impressively and does so well. It's part of it. So, like, but in the same way, like, in, Look at this here. How embarrassed must James Tony feel as we watch the end of this fight again? He stands up. There's just a bunch of UFC fans who all showed up to watch him lose, and they're just laughing and cheering because boxing sucks and MMA will always beat it. And part of me feels bad that I will be watching the same thing happen to Conor McGregor. Like, <laughs> if it goes the way... Oh, come on. <laughs> Don't zoom in on phony cameraman. But that's what I'm talking about. Like, there's going to be some boxing motherfucker sitting at a boxing show holding up that sign with some clever play on how Conor McGregor is notorious the best boxer or whatever. And, like, better than that. (laughs) It won't be. But it's going to be humiliating. Like, if if it goes the way we expect, he's going to look bad and he's going to be made to look silly and foolish. So, here's the really, here's the main question of this fight. Are we gonna get a UFC chant? Oh, I hope so. If Conor McGregor gets something, because that would be the most amazing, yeah, lame dipshit thing to happen. <laughs> if a bunch of people like start going UFC, UFC, it would be amazing. It'll to replicate happen. it, I'm just that gonna sit on, I'm just gonna sit on Twitter, and every 20 seconds, I'm gonna tweet out those three letters, just to replicate the <laughs> yeah. experience in case it doesn't happen. Yeah. Oh, it's man, this whole thing it just it can't be over fast enough, you know? Look at Randy Couture mm-hmm. just laughing, just just filled with evil glee at how easy it was. The thing is the thing is this fight hasn't even I don't even feel like it's really energized people to put out any great anything about no. it. It's just like kind of looking into this giant, slowly whirling trash gyre, just one that's full of like luxury <laughs> goods, like it's off the coast of Dubai, and just looking into it and thinking, what's in there? Is there something worth saying about this? Yeah, no, it's just is... trash, expensive trash. That's how I feel. Is It's like I, the whole fight is 
I have been trying so hard to come up with angles, and I do think it like we found ways to, to to make this interesting, even to us, which is usually the sign of a good vivisection when Zane and I end the show being pretty interested in the card. But I spent so much time in the lead up to this fight as a writer, and as someone who's supposed to have thoughtful, interesting things to say about combat sports, just at a loss for how to make this interesting because. Like it's 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 yeah. interesting in a way, but it's not compelling. Like it doesn't make me feel anything. So, like because it's meaningless. So, and, and to add to what yeah. you said, I mean, Phil, if if McGregor does win, that might mean he never comes back to MMA, and that would be the worst outcome of all. Because I yeah. want to see Conor McGregor continue to do what he's good at. Yeah, and um, he's a he's a like his run to the title like with like and you know unfortunately have to, that we have to mention it it's like john jones is yeah uh what year was it 2013 2011 uh, i think was it yeah was it that it, long ago yeah it was that long ago 2011 he had that crazy run that's when he beat bader yeah. to fight shogun i think like mcgregor fought so much and he they were they were all like these thrilling fights in one way or the other i just want to see more of that I don't want to yeah. see this. I don't want to. I'm like, and and he, if he wins, it is. I'm sorry, but like, he's people are going to be like, oh, you meant to. He's going to land the left or whatever. People can be like, well, he meant to throw it. It's like everyone means to throw something in a fight. That doesn't mean that. Like, it's the it's the fact that if he lands it, it's going to have to be. It'll have to have things happen alongside it, which no one can control. It will have to be the exact perfect. You know, micro second, like it will have to land to the millimeter to the right spot to somehow knock Floyd out instantaneously. Yeah, and he just like it. It can't not be a fluke, and because he's he's not built his way up in any kind of boxing, in any kind of he hasn't built his way up in it in for it to be anything other than a fluke. It can't like if it happens, yeah. I'll I'll just literally go. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the perfect way to say it. Like this, the result, the fight can end in two ways: a fluke or exactly what I expected. So yeah, why am I watching it? <laughs> right? Like, yeah. it you like to. I mean, like you just have to. It's what that's the unfortunate <laughs> part. It's like prestige TV. Like it's not as good as everyone says, but you have to fucking watch it. Yeah. Although the next day, yeah. I'm not. TV, but. I'm not staying. I'm not staying up for it. Yeah, yeah me, me neither. I'm gonna have some friends around, and yeah, I'm gonna watch The Walking Zoom. Dead instead. I'm I'm gonna be doing a post-fight show with Scott Christ. To... <laughs> oh yeah, you do, yeah, you're doing thirty th the thirteenth round. Yeah, that reminds me to upload round. the. And I'm gonna try to be the most uneducated MMA side of it as I can possibly. Oh yeah, please. Be our, be our Brandon Schaub, Zane. Be our yeah, Brandon Schaub. Be... <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's the point. That's the problem. You can't actually live up to Brendan Chow. Yeah. No, I, I don't. I would never want if to you cry. consciously cry. I want your breakdown to be uh, to be all about the unique angles at which Conor McGregor's head flew around as as Mayweather's jab connected. <laughs> uh, no, the only thing I'm going to talk about is how Floyd Mayweather, Mayweather was running and <laughs> he didn't jump. Oh yeah. And it, it, running wins a boxing match. If this were a real fight and not a boxing match, Conor McGregor would have won. But because Floyd chose to run and Conor McGregor chose not to unlock his superpowers, he didn't win. <laughs> so that means my Sunday op-ed has to be titled, uh, Yeah, But Can He Stop the Double Leg? Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got to do. All right. On that note, let's wrap things up. You can find me on Twitter at these ain't time. You can find Connor on Twitter at Boxing Bush. You can find Phil on Twitter at Evil Greg Jacks. You can find all three of us over at BloodyElbow.com. D o t c o m. Wait, no. Dot com. Whatever. You know what dot com means. Shit. Uh, you can find <laughs> our videos over at MMANation.com. D o t c o m on YouTube. Uh, give us a like, subscribe, thumbs up. All that shit. Turn on notifications. It all helps. We all need it desperately. We will be back next week, I believe, with an actual UFC card to talk about. Uh, the UFC is... Let me see. What's... Isn't it like Struve something or other? Yeah, it's something. Like... 
GFC yeah. <laughs> Volkov event in so like, Rotterdam. Oh, yeah. So. You're like, not, yeah, finally a UFC event. And then you're like, oh. Yeah. The, the, the thrill of watching Jermaine Durandamy and Marion Renault in the co-main event and, you know, Stefan Struve and Alexander Volkov be tall. <laughs> it really is the perfect follow-up to McGregor Mayweather because after Connor gets embarrassed and humiliated, the UFC is saying, well, how about this? <laughs> and this is what they're going to show the yeah. world. <laughs> like, uh, all right. Boy. We'll be back for that. Anyway, on that note, see you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, and we will be uh, we'll be back next week. Bye.